All right. Uh, so this afternoon, our session will be looking at gaps and solutions. So this morning, we were discussing about the alliance, why we need the alliance, how to pursue the alliance, how to make our alliance inclusive. So that was our discussion this morning. This afternoon, we're going to look at the gaps and how we intend to respond to those gaps. So without saying anything more, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Tanapon, game, to present the study on the critical knowledge gaps for sustainable and resilient water energy climate nexus in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. And then Tanapon would have uh, 15 minutes and please ensure that you stay within 15 minutes. Thank you, Tanapon. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone uh, from my previous colleague and new face. So uh, this is my great opportunity again to share uh, the result from this uh, program about the critical knowledge gap on water, energy, and climate nexus. So I will start with uh, a, a figure to uh, give you idea how climate, water, energy linkage in the Mekong was is a key context. So in terms of climate in the Mekong, there are three, uh, I think, issues that you usually hear or heard, you know, from many meetings regarding to increased uh, temperature. This is, I think, a usual word everywhere. Also, uh, I think the second one is very much, I think, uh, experienced by the uh, people or local people, particularly on the extreme event in terms of flood and droughts. And we cannot forget Mekong Delta that now I think they are facing uh, a lot of challenge in terms of uh, uh, sea level rise because of the climate change. Uh, look at the water agenda in the Mekong. I think uh, they talk a lot for water security, or in another term, also linked to the water productivity. What water productivity mean? How much value of one drop of water? You know, so that is also linked to the socio-economic development agenda for the uh, uh, country in these regions. And again, uh, you uh, may see people living with flood, living with droughts, you know? Drought and flood is common issue here. But however, as uh, we see or observe or hear the uh, news in last five or 10 years ago, people start complain, people start uh, chow up about more extreme in terms of flood and drought, both in terms of magnitude and uh, what's that? Uh, magnitude and uh, uh, intensity. Uh, the third one related uh, very well. I, the third one in terms of water that, that very important is about water for ecosystem. So this uh, a topic linked to the sediment, fishery, ecosystem service, etc. So in water sphere, these are three kind of key topic, you know, in the Mekong that are talking about or that's are the challenge that we need uh, the solution to address. In terms of energy, I think we cannot say no about hydropower <laughs> in the Mekong. And it's always a hot, very hot, super hot topic <laughs> and still hot, maybe another five to 10 years, I would say that. <laughs> so, so this is also a key. However, as we know, the hydropower is not only one energy resort in this region. I think the main energy system here, of course, is still uh, uh, dominated by uh, fossil energy. But however, we foresee the trend that the renewable energy option is become more and more popular and more and more investment at the local and country scale. And the last one, of course, is offset between uh, green energy is uh, fossil fuel energy. So I think in the morning, you already 
here that like in Thailand, Dr. Vijan uh, mentioned about uh, net zero target. So this is also linked to the fossil energy. And if you see the linkage, you can see here, uh, climate can impact on supply and demand and also under of hydrological circle, hydrological circle. Hydrological circle is starting point of everything of water. You know, we get water from ground water or rainforest. So that is the main thought. So if climate change and affect water ability, then this water productivity, flood drought, and ecosystem will be affected. Similar, climate change also can impact on supply and demand of energy. When we get hotter, we want more air condition, you need more energy, right? Or when there is a drought, there is a lack of energy, you know? So that also affect kind of energy supply and demand. If you look at the water linked to the energy and climate, as you see here, water is used to produce energy to use to uh, cooling the thermal system. Uh -huh. Also water can impact between upstream and downstream regulation. That also consequent. Uh, water or ecosystem can be a part of climate regulation or carbon sink, you know, that also the connection with the climate. In terms of energy, you can see that uh, energy link the climate, most of the topic we talk is about carbon emissions, carbon capture and carbon storage, that kind of the topic. And of course, water and energy, we uh, link with the uh, kind of infrastructure system like pumping, distribution, irrigation, uh, desalination. So to do that, we need energy, you know, to change from water to, to moving water, we need energy. That's maybe the key. And also energy can uh, impact, you know, flow and ecosystem like hydropower that we know uh, for some time already on this topic. At the end, Cup, for this highlight, I think, okay, the program is try to forecast water, energy, climate, next start, but the core at the uh, heart of the next start here also, we have to look at the environmental safeguard, community at risk, and also gender equality, disability, and social inclusion in this kind of approach. So my next, I try to say that the, there are a lot of existing knowledge now in terms of Nexus since 2014 that I foresee a lot of study coming out. So right now it's almost 10 years. So that's why there are many existing knowledge try to look at where is the next at where is challenge, how you address those challenge. So I'm not go to detail, but my point is our study is based on this kind of literature review, getting knowledge from uh, expertise and try to come up with the critical knowledge for this program. The first knowledge that I would like to say is critical is to direct to the vulnerable group people or who are living in the rural area or re remote area that still need the energy to support their livelihood. So that's why how to enhance renewable energy transition for poor, marginalized and climate vulnerable group, including women and children living with disability, but why still reduce water insecurity in the climate change. This is a critical challenge. There is a lot of policy at national level on renewable energy uh, sector policy, you know, but it's not go deep yet into this kind of group of people. And we know that the energy have to side off grid and on grid or integrate grid, uh, integrated grid, you know. So the renewable energy, uh, renewable energy keep an opportunity, you know, to help these people better because the cost of renewable energy, particularly like solar, it's become low that like people can can buy it in the market, you know, in the part is always uh, difficult for people to access it. 
second, I think it's also uh, Lily went to the uh, early morning section in the panel that uh, the representative from uh, CDI Cambodian talk about the storage. So the the challenge in the Mekong now uh, is the system, the river system is changing from the natural flow into the regulation flow. This is going to be a new baseline of the Mekong. We cannot dream that we going to get that back, as I can say it now, because many monitoring stations, many observations from local people, many evidence is very clear that the Mekong flow is changing already. So however, that is kind of negative impact and positive impact. You know, we can discuss more later, but I don't really want to touch that. But I would like to look at the opportunity that we have more storage installation in the system, you know, in terms of both uh, infrastructure storage and nature storage. And this storage will be kind of uh, limited. Uh, this storage will help, you know, people in many ways. So that's why. The second uh, uh, knowledge that we look in terms of systematic thinking and uh, next uh, integration approach is what are the way to balance infrastructure and nature water solid management option for multi-purpose to enhance equitable benefit sharing and reduce climate risk. And you can see this kind of uh, storage in Siriton Dam that try to install floating solar. That's a big gate, I think, floating solar in the region now. And you can see very beautiful nature solid in Vietnam, you know, as a national park. The third critical knowledge, this is something for the kind of uh, uh, new global trend. When you talk about the artificial intelligence, remote sensing, IoT, you know, now people are able to access the internet, you know, how to apply or use this technology, you know, to improve warning notification system for climate uh, vulnerability group and water energy operator during extreme weather, unusual flow and flood and drought, you know. People know that the system is changing. They want to adapt, but they need notification in advance. That will help them a lot to adapt. Game, yes. can we wrap up in three minutes? Yeah, the fourth gap is about uh, growing long-term climate change adaptations. So this is look something more long-term, you know? And that is also a challenge because of the uh, climate impact is quite uncertain here, uh, here in now and the future, how we can provide long-term view for climate change in particularly in the context of transboundary. So that is also uh, uh, important and how to link with the uh, uh, community and social marginal uh, group on the adaptations. Uh, the fifth knowledge gap is about, of course, today meetings. You know, we have a lot of good think tank organizations. You uh, have experience in influencing policy. So how we gonna enhance the effectiveness of these think tank organizations and how we can use think tank as a bridge to bring knowledge to the policy and influence them. So that is a, a, a gap. And the last one that we cannot forget is about jet, Jesse, you know, a way to mainstream uh, uh, Jesse into uh, water, energy, climate, Nexat policy, and related to coordination mechanism. I would like to stop my presentation here in terms of question, how we can integrate the next step into the regional policy for climate action toward just an equitable outcome for panel discussion. And let me give a few seconds to sell the can call again <laughs> for the flagship and rapid response fund. If you're interested to apply the grant to address, to address this knowledge gap, please feel free to apply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Game. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, but can you hold on to your questions for now? Because we're going to invite a panel of experts who can help us enlighten about those gaps. But so can I request uh, our friends, uh, Ajahn Pichamun from Deakin University, 
John Doerr from Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australia. Uh, Mr. Suprien Chia, the Chief River Basin Planner of the Mekong River Commission. Ms. Perong Sadong, I, if you're around, uh, who is the Executive Director of Bantis Ray, Cambodia, to please join on stage. All right. Okay, so again, a reminder, these are the gaps that were identified by game earlier. And then the next, there's also another set of gaps actually that was related, but they were not actively uh, discussed. Next slide, Agus. Which are this set of, of gaps, but the important one is uh, the, the, the knowledge related gaps. Next slide, Agus. So yeah, so to reflect on those gaps, um, I have here a framework from, I'm sure you know this guy, Donald Rumsfeld. In about 2002, I think, after the bombing in Iraq, he was, he was in a press conference and then he was asked whether there were map weapons of mass destruction being found in Iraq and um, if there are other things that he learned from the, what happened in Iraq. And this is what he said. There are no knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things that we do not know we don't know. So that will be the job of our experts to help us reflect on those different dimensions. Next slide, Agus. So we're going to look at the known known. So what do we know? What are the gaps that we are aware of, but we have evidence for? So in other words, to, 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 to tell us whether the gaps that game had identified were really the gaps ba based on experiences. And then there are also known unknowns, the things we know we don't know. And then, but we are aware of them. And then on the other quadrant are things that are the unknown knowns. We don't know about them, but somebody does. But, and maybe that someone is not telling us. And then the hardest quadrant would be the unknown unknowns. We don't know about them until we start thinking about them now. So next slide, please. So our goal is, so that's how the quadrant is going to look like. So our goal is to expand the known known quadrant towards the unknown so that we can reduce the unknown areas into this. Next slide. So to begin the conversation, okay, oh, before that, Agus. Okay, to begin that conversation, may I ask Ms. Perong Sadong, who is the Executive Director of Bantis Ray in Cambodia? to tell us about the known known. So are the gaps that were identified gaps that you actually see in the field? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, respected guest speaker. Um, I'm Pierong from Cambodia. Uh, I would speak actually based on the practice of one of the local organization in Cambodia. So Bantisre is a woman-led organization. We work a lot with the community who are affected by the climate change. So looking into the gap that has been highlighted earlier, uh, there are many areas, actually also new area for me, but some area that I totally agree that uh, it, it is a gap. It is a really true gap uh, regarding to the uh, capacity um, as well as the, uh, the uh, governings of the, um, of the long-term uh, climate change adaptations and also the challenge and the uh, success in terms of gender mainstreaming, including disability, social inclusion in the women's, uh, uh, sorry, in the uh, water, um, energy, and climate change, for example. So, looking into the challenge regarding to the limitation of the awareness, I totally agree because a, a lot of us uh, at the community level, we don't understand, uh, we don't, we we learn, we we heard a lot about the clim climate change, but what is it exactly? Does the community people aware enough of uh, the climate change affect their life? Uh, in Cambodia, there are uh, 70%, more than 70% who live in the rural area. 
and the climate change are totally affected those who live in the rural area. And more than 50% are women, actually. And um, based on our work with the community women, they are the one who actually uh, direct affected their livelihood. Uh, the women who are pregnant also affected, but they don't aware of how to prevent it. Uh, they don't aware of how to ensure that uh, climate change adaptations approach. Even though at the moment there are a lot of action plan and the policy that has introduced it by the government, but the, the limitation out there regarding to the awareness from the community is still there. So I would just pin out a bit of that. Uh, I totally agree on the actually the gap that has been highlighted, but what more on the uh, gender perspective. Thank you. Thank you. So we will have another round of discussion for which you can add other insights. Now, Ajahn Pichamon, from where you sit, are there biases, are there things that you think you know which we have not figured out in the gaps that we have identified? That's a great question. And I have to say the emoji that you see on the, I'm not sure the slide is up there anymore, um, but the four quadrants, the emoji with the really confused face, that's probably me as I was thinking about the known unknowns. Um, and of course we have to leave it to Albert to give us a very difficult task. Um, that's very intellectually challenging. <laughs> So in terms of, as I was thinking about this, I thought to myself, you know, in relation to knowledge gaps, policy gaps um, pertaining to sustainability and resilience, I felt like the known unknowns that we often talk about exist on different levels. So you have, you know, policy known unknowns, you have technical known unknowns, you have operational ones also. Um, and each of these speak to different types of knowledge gaps. So whether it be you know, the, the lack of understanding still around how to implement JEDC in an effective manner, for instance, or it could be, you know, what does a just transition actually look like when it comes to renewable energy? But also, it was mentioned by the previous speaker, new technology, what do we do with that? What are the ethical conundrums that arise from the utilization of new technology? And so altogether this, I feel these issues um, make me think about some fundamental quest questions um, when it comes to these known unknowns. And I thought of four in particular, and Albert, please do stop me if I'm going over time. One but, minute. One minute, okay. Uh, the first question was really, how can we affect the positive change that we want to see most effectively in the policy process? I feel this is very much a known unknown in the sense that we are aware that there are gaps when it comes to policy implementation, but also policy influence, and how do we actually go about that? There still doesn't seem to be very hard evidence as to what works or what doesn't work. Um, the second question was, you know, in view of how interconnectedness defines the water, energy, and climate nexus, what might be the unintended consequences of deliberate human um, activity or development intervention on ecosystem processes and environmental flows in particular. And this is of course why many of us are here today, to actually unpack that question and better understand the implications. But of course, when it comes to unintended consequences, many of our brains aren't actually geared towards thinking about unintended consequences because we all like to think that we're rational and we've done the cost benefit analyses. But as we've seen time and time again, things often happen in ways that are unanticipated and it's very much when it comes to the concept of resilience itself, it's very much about anticipating uncertainty, being able to cope with it, and then build the ability to adapt and mitigate those unintended consequences later. So I have many more questions as you can imagine, but in view of, I'm pretty sure I've, I've, uh, I don't have time left, um, there are many more questions I feel that we can ask as part of that known unknown quadrant. Um, and which really we have to dig deep in order to think about the bigger picture and what it all means when it comes to building actual resilience and sustainability. Thanks, Ajahn Pichuman. Um, I like what you've said about the unintended consequences. So in the language of adaptation, the maladaptation of our outcomes or, or the, the, the maladaptive outcomes. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Soperin Chia, being the Chief River Basin Planner of the Mekong River Commission, is there a gap that we are unaware of, but should be discussed here? 
I, I uh, first of all, thanks a lot for involving me and also the Mekong River Commission Secretariat into the uh, uh, forum. I appreciate that as well. We've done a lot of things, especially uh, uh, with regard to the knowledge uh, gap and in engagement that we are discussing today. Uh, so for now, uh, related uh, to the question that raised, I just would like to highlight uh, one of the main important points is about the work that we are trying to do now, the so-called uh, uh, proactive regional planning, in which uh, one of the particular issues is around the cascade operation or cascade management. So uh, we, we know that uh, the importance uh, of, of, of the nexus, of the water, of the energy, the connection uh, with the climate change as well as the uh, food uh, with regard to the social and economic uh, dimension are very important. And, and we know that uh, there are a lot of engagement uh, from different stakeholders, civil society and government. But at the same time, uh, the, one of the challenges that we need to further dig down is on the uh, cascade operation. We, there are a lot of infrastructure is going on in, 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 uh, in the Mekong River uh, Basin. So uh, some of them, for example, just take into example of the uh, dam development. There are a lot of developers, the operators, and also country. So they need to, to, to have some, uh, some sort of approach uh, uh, we call it a coordination approach where we can facilitate uh, not just only the, the exchange of information, for example, the water discharge, the, the information that is useful for the community as well as for the, uh, the downstream uh, to manage and to plan well. But also uh, we need uh, some sort of mechanism where, where uh, the, the, the different stakeholders, the operator, the government, and also the, the purchaser can can talk to each other and and in a coordinated way, uh, and in doing that, uh, we 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 have a lot of uh, study, we have a lot of uh, of, of report, but 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 when it comes to the question whether we do enough in terms of ensuring a good uh, information sharing and uh, coordination and management way, so I think that is still uh, the the issues that we can. Uh, further highlight. But for the MOC Secretariat, we are now working with, with member country uh, to, to enhance and improve the way we monitor the, 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 uh, the information related to the discharge and operation along the, the Mekong. And also, uh, we hope that uh, by the pro uh, regional proactive uh, regional planning, uh, the first phase we can complete by uh, next year. We can improve our monitoring system and also help with the analysis and assessment and can uh, better inform to the community and, uh, uh, and uh, the Mekong countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Superior. Now, John, you've studied the region, you're involved in a lot of things in the region, and having listened to your co-panelists and what also game had presented, is there something that we still don't get it, right? Well, there's plenty of things I don't get, Albert, <laughs> but uh, first of all, uh, I never thought I'd be reflecting on a stage about the wisdom of Donald Rumsfeld. So that's, uh, that's a pleasure. Um, if Pichamon sort of spoke about unintended consequences, my, my sort of take home from the next couple of minutes is um, the importance of credible speculation uh, for this, this quadrant here of the unknown unknowns. Now, I was getting confused about that phrase, to be honest, but um, what I've jotted down here, which I read somewhere, was just, it's not that complicated. The unknown unknowns are completely unexpected or unforeseeable conditions or events, risks that we cannot imagine or I cannot imagine, or are simply factors of whose existence we or I are unaware. So, okay, my first point is that my uh, unknown unknowns and my lack of imagination does not have to be yours. So we are part of a learning community here and we can learn uh, from and with each other as we are today. So what comes to my mind? Uh, and I'm not sure if the slide that Shreya knocked up for me uh, a few minutes ago is visible. Yeah. So what comes to my mind? I mean, I couldn't have imagined uh, the global flu epidemic that started just over 100 years ago and killed 50 million people. Um, I did not imagine the pace of solar technology innovation 
an advancement since they made the first vol, uh, solar cell in about 1975. As a kid, I could not imagine bees disappearing. Uh, I certainly did not imagine the uh, speed of spread and impact of COVID-19. And I certainly uh, did not imagine um, these uh, dirty little uh, fire ants that are now sort of uh, spreading their way across the world and are quite a threat. So solar expansion, bee threats, C-19 and fire ants. These are or were some of my sort of unknown unknowns. I had not been imagining, anticipating, looking at the emerging data or planning action to respond to these events. But fortunately, some other people had. And I think that's, that's another key point to me that my unknown unknowns may not be yours. My second point, uh, Albert, and you did say five minutes in the uh, brief, so give us a moment. And my second point is that thinking through the knock-on effects is a key function of the learning communities. So with thanks to Miko, um, I reference a quick piece in the New York Times by Bill Gale in 2019. He wrote about climate's troubling unknown unknowns. Gale noted that climate assessments were often concentrating on stock taking. And a lot of us get involved in stock taking, you know, um, which is really looking at known knowns or, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a less speculative um, venture. But Gail makes the case strongly that there is a need for credible speculation by policymakers and therefore also presumably knowledge-based policy influence organizations. I won't quote him because we're sort of uh, short of time, but um, let's just use one example, back to bees. If bees were to disappear, then think of the impact on crops, food, photosynthesis, and uh, carbon dioxide absorption. Einstein apparently said, and I say apparently because he's had so many quotes attributed to him that I don't know how he could have said them all, but Einstein apparently said, if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would have only four years of life left. No more bees, no more pollination, no more plants, no more animals, no more man. So let's maintain our commitment to credible speculation and I think that quadrant sort of gives us that space. My last point in this uh, first round, uh, Albert, is I see the knowledge related gaps and I like the list. Um, I see the policy and practice related gaps and I like the list, um, but I'd suggest we have a few methodological gaps and, and, not even, and we don't have a section on methodology. Um, for example, in dealing, and just one example, in dealing with the unknown unknowns and the other quadrants, I'd really like to see uh, a bit of a sharpened understanding and approaches to scenarios and their connection to deliberative processes within and across borders. Scenarios, processes that are not revolving totally around feeding models. Um, deliberation that is not perfunctory. Deliberation that includes lots of different perspectives and definitely at least a few people with really vivid imaginations. There's a guy called Saul Griffith in Australia. He really helped the Biden administration with their energy policy. And now he's come back to Australia, thankfully, and he's helping our government sort of imagine our energy futures. You know, rewiring the USA, now sort of rewiring Australia. So deliberation that encourages credible speculation, but then keeps examining evidence as it emerges. So we don't, you know, lose sight of the scientific project. Um, and to do that deliberation that is repeated and sustained. I've been involved in too many initiatives that did a scenarios process and then said, oh, if we had more time, we'd do a better job. You know, end of project, end of initiative, end of discussion. I think the repeatability is really important. Thanks, Albert. Thank you very much, John. So I hope, um, so the, I guess the key message here is that we need a bit of intellectual humility, right, with regards to how we try to understand some of the, these kinds of issues, because there are things that we might know, but there are also things that others would know. And really having this opportunity to have conversation to discuss can actually help us expand that boundary of what we know. Now, before I give our panelists a second round, is there a reflection or questions from the floor? Either a question about the gaps that game identified or a question, to, or if you have opinions on what our panelists have discussed. 
Anyone would like to take on the challenge? Niall? Not necessarily a challenge, but I'm, I just remember an argument I had in college years ago. And the, the final comment I made before I walked away from somebody was, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Um, and that's the reality of what we're looking at here. But we can't be in a position where we have to wait and wait and wait to find out the, the unknown unknown. So how much risk do we take to drive with what we do know, even though there might be gaps, um, to make sure we're not waiting for the perfect answer that may never come along? I think that was a question to the three of you. Okay. If you want to respond to that one, please go ahead. But in, in one or two minutes. Any quick, uh, or otherwise we can wait a bit and then let's see if we can get other people to ask questions. I wonder, do Ajahn Apichai, you've been involved in this kind of issues for quite a while, being the director of the environmental division of the ASEAN and maybe other things. What would be your reflection with regards to these particular gaps or the discussion that we just had now? Uh, I think this morning we heard Kun uh, uh, right? He was talking about transboundary air pollution. Uh, I was, uh, 25 years ago, I was in the hotspot uh, as an environmental focal point in ASEAN, and we have this big fire and haze in Sumatra and Kalimantan. It was burning, never ending, because it was an El Nino year, okay? And so that caused ASEAN to come up with a subsequently an, ag an agreement on transboundary haze pollution. Today, it's actually 20, not today, but this year is actually the 20th anniversary of that agreement. Uh, so we have the agreement, but somehow the problem still remains. So maybe some of the issues are known, why it is not being able to be implemented, whereas others are yet to be maybe discovered. Why is, uh, or, or is there something wrong with ASEAN? <laughs> okay, that many people ask about that. But I think maybe one of the things that perhaps we can um, try to take away is that, you know, the Singapore has this Nanyang Technological University and uh, they have a, what they call the Rajaratnam uh, School of International Studies. And their motto is ponder the improbable. In other words, right? You need to think or imagine creatively, of course, like what John Doerr is saying, uh, with uh, scientific, you know, evidence and everything, but to credible or somebody was saying what? It's critical speculation, right? And I think your, your example of the your, uh, Australian you know, energy expert doing that is a clear example. So you have to sort of think beyond, okay? Like for example, we know about like a tsunami, well, talking about Fukushima, uh, tsunami hit uh, 20, uh, 2011, right? But we have in our region also tsunami hitting in 2004, right? But can you imagine a tsunami in the Mekong? Think about it. What could be the possible, you know, uh, <laughs> causative of any tsunami in the Mekong? But I have thought about it. <laughs> I've written about it. And basically is if a major earthquake strikes one of the big dams in China, okay? The dam breaks. And all of a sudden the whole water gushes down. Do you think that any of the subsequent dams would be able to hold back that amount of volume of water at that speed and uh, that, you know, uh, that uh, energy? Probably not. So you have a domino effect down the Mekong. So what would happen to the Mekong uh, downstream, like where we're, you know, the Southeast Asian countries or the Mekong countries, are. okay? So something like that. Thank you. Thanks, that's a very good example of credible speculations. Any other comments or questions? If not, can I return now to our panel? Okay, Ajahn Pichaman, please go ahead. I, I would like to take a stab at the first question, but before I do so, I had a question for John, which is when you say credible speculation, credible by whose standards, right? Because thinking about the different quadrants and what constitutes acceptable knowledge or known knowns or known unknowns or unknown knowns, it has to be determined by someone. And who is that someone? I suppose what I'm pointing to is just, even when it comes to the question that you'd asked about pushing boundaries and not just you know, waiting around twiddling our thumbs and actually doing something, I, I agree that's incredibly important. But at the same time, going back to your point, Albert, we have to of course be very mindful and wary of our own biases 
our own subjectivities, because otherwise we might actually just be aggravating a problem as opposed to actually finding a solution. And I suppose part of the, the challenge with these four quadrants is that they focus more on the gaps as opposed to the solutions. So what are the known knowns when it comes to solutions that have actually worked based on multi-stakeholder consultations, not just one agency or one individual? What are the known unknowns then? And so I guess to me, um, you know, in my other role, I recently conducted a country mission as part of a UN delegation to Japan. And part of our mission, we also looked at the case of the Fukushima um, nuclear disaster and the release of the treated water um, into the Pacific. And what really struck me there was that, of course, the Japanese government was, say was saying, we have scientific evidence that's also been you know, um, proved and, and all that by other reputable agencies saying that there will be no dire consequences on ecosystems in the Pacific. But of course, if you ask the fisher folk, if you ask the people living in the vicinity who have faced firsthand the impacts of the disaster, they will say, we don't really believe the government on this on, in this instance. So whose knowledge matters? Um, I guess the question I'll throw back to all of you. Important one, John. So thank you for the question, as they say on the TV. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I don't mean sort of completely uh, uh, unfounded speculation. I don't mean um, noise. Uh, we've got a referendum coming up in Australia in a few weeks, and there's so much noise and not credible speculation. So um, credible speculation. Martin Green at University of New South Wales, you know, knows a little bit about solar cells. So when he starts speculating about what might be the next generation of solar cells, then I'm interested, you know? So I do believe that there is still judgment that has to be um, uh, taken into account, but I think we should listen to ideas and then see if the person that is putting them forward, they or their colleagues can, can start to back it up and, and test it a little bit. That's all, thank you. Hirong, do you have anything to add on this conversation with regards to particularly among the organizations that you're working on the ground? Is there a, a grassroots perspective with regards to how we understand all of these issues? Um, probably I would just pin out one of the um, evidence uh, enhancing effective uh, civil society knowledge, because I think it's really one of the crucial issues and the gap that we are facing at the moment, because um, regarding to uh, the knowledge of uh, documentation, the data and information that are available or exist, uh, community people are experienced at uh, the community level, but we we uh, haven't actually put much effort uh, uh, to produce those evidence-based study uh, to do advocacy uh, activity at the, at the national level or regional level. So I think it's one of the important thing. And based on our experience, uh, because when this day we work with community-based organization, and a lot of them are uh, the, the vulnerable groups that are affected by those issues. Um, we form them, uh, provide, provide capacity building to them to be able to do action-based research. Uh, but most of those research is actually doing advocacy, a dialogue with the subnational authority level. And it's it's been aware that it's the issue affected them, but uh, we haven't had the community voice are heard at the national and also regional level. I think it's important for us, all of us here, would bring out some of the affected community voice uh, to be heard and also to actually find it the solution to actually respond to them and uh, part of the awareness as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting because with regards to issues about inclusion and participation, it's not something that's totally unknown, right? It's very much known. And we've had a number of opportunities to discuss about these issues. And yet it seems the solutions are really quite complicated to address, right? I wonder, um, Superin, in, in the work that you do at MRC, to what extent credible speculation is something that you engage at MRC? I, I, I think the, the problem that, that happened uh, is that we, we can see some 
of the reaction or feedback from the community level, which is some 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 sometimes uh, most of the time they experience what is happening. For example, in in the upper part of the uh, of of the river, they experience the low flow. They experience the uh, the the impact from for their livelihood used to the uh, chain of the uh, rapid uh, rapid flow, etc. So so we for 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 us we do some uh, some some. Uh, study we we try to explain and uh, try to find out the the root cause but but sometimes uh, there is some discrepancy the, the the differences between what we we scientifically try to prove and what uh, what the community themselves uh, experience at, at at the community level so this this uh, discrepancy that we need to uh, uh, try to further work in in terms of trying to inform them and and also uh, work with them to explore their experience uh, in order to translate it into the uh, the study as well as the policy that we we need to tackle so so so, so that is all the work that we we need to do for that okay thank you very much i wonder again with our participants do you have anything to add yes uh, can we have a microphone for uh Chandrit, please okay just yes. very good so uh our participants online as well if there are comments or questions uh we'll be happy to read them yeah go ahead uh thank you very much um I have two questions. Um, one is about uh, no known, and the other one is about I don't um unknown known or I don't know whatever. <laughs> That's uh, very confusing. But um, yeah, my my colleagues uh not my my friend uh superior talk about uh, difficulties um in uh, bringing uh, all different uh, stakeholders to talk together in a coordinated uh, manner, uh, especially in uh, trying to understand uh, the nexus of water and climate energy issues. So um, my question is, uh, what, what have been known about uh, effective approaches in bringing the different stakeholders together to come to the same table uh, to to have a like coordinated discussion about uh, the nexus that we we are discussing, and the other question: What have we not known? Why it's difficult? You know why why it's difficult to bring you know the different stakeholders at various levels, communities, um, academic, uh, especially the 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 private sector dam operators uh, upstream to come to talk to share information and data in a coordinated way thank you so Brian, you want to respond to that question yeah i, I will try i'm pretty sure that uh, other panel can also uh, supplement as well so i think uh well for in terms of uh what way that we can do uh to ensure this uh different stakeholder engage I think this this kind of form of uh, dialogue and and consultation uh, is still uh, valid, meaning that we can uh, we we can still continue uh, promoting this uh, kind of uh, dialogue engagement and and awareness raisings. Uh, but on top of this, maybe after uh, such kind of meeting and sharing, what we can do more is to keep uh, uh, engage uh, on the, uh, to ensure we have a platform where where idea can flow, where idea can exchange, especially a report and study, concrete report and study can be stored and shared uh, somewhere. So I think that is uh, additional. And, and what constrains us uh, from, from having a good in, and a meaningful engagement? We know already that uh, we work by, by, by framework, we work by law and regulation, and also uh, agenda driven. So some, I think sometimes this is the, the difficulty that we face. Uh, for example, for us, we work need uh, a lot of support with the government, but when it down to the consultation, we for sure need to work with the government to ensure uh, what is the right uh, participation uh, in line with the, uh, with the national uh, law and regulation. 
So sometimes uh, this 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 kind of uh, constraint that you need to also be supplement or, or regulate regulate by by uh, by working with other uh, organization or, or stakeholder as well. So we we need to what I'm trying to say is uh, we need to uh, to reach out and work with other uh, who who's have their expertise and uh, maybe the limit uh, uh, can be uh, uh, overcome our our uh, limitation. I see that John, you've jotted some notes, but Pirong first, if you want to go and, and respond to that question. Thank you. Um, about what uh, known is <laughs> what is known is known. Uh, probably I cannot answer to that much. To uh, mm -hmm. uh, the moderator can explain, but it's about the gap that we are aware and we have evidence for. And regarding to your questions about, is there any uh, best uh, lesson learned we can learn from the the best uh, coordinations, effective coordinations among different stakeholders. For me, I don't I don't have any uh, ex experience seeing effective coordination uh, with different stakeholders yet into the issue because like uh, uh, Bong has mentioned earlier, it's a really cross cutting, but it's really constrained to having all of different stakeholders come to discuss and consult because it's lack of two reasons. One prob probably uh, about the uh, technical resources, because in each different department and institutions, they have their own agenda and priority. And when it comes to this particular issue, does the organization or institution have their technical resource on this issue? Second is about funding, uh, financial resources. Does they put much effort into a located budget to focus on these issues? So I think all of this is a constraint, but I haven't come across any good experience uh, that we could share with you that uh, uh, some of the places that have been successfully coordinated in one particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pichaman or John, you want to say something on this one? I'm happy to hear last. <laughs> yeah. There may be no more time. Um, <laughs> I, uh, one of the best jobs I was ever involved in was uh, when I was working with IUCN quite a long time ago. And uh, the, 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 the frame was sort of negotiate and reaching agreements over water. And it wasn't looking for gaps or things that had gone wrong. We basically uh, put the word out for uh, across the globe who thought they'd been involved in a high quali high quality multi-stakeholder process and then invited them to sort of tell their story about it. And we ended up, um, I can get them for you, got about 50 sort of uh, good stories from around the world of real processes. So one was in uh, Nepal. So Nepal had a, a dams and development dialogue. It was around the time of the World Commission on Dams, very hot issue in Nepal. And so 18 months out, a whole, you know, a few Pretty um, creative actors. Um, some of them, you know, Achia Dichit and uh, Deepak Iwali and others. They had it a a good process that government liked, the developers liked, the banks liked, the NGOs liked. Where they all learned about the options for Nepal. And they all felt sort of respected in the process, and they all then made a bit of a joint input to the World Commission on Dams. You know, but so it's just a. Um, it's sometimes very heartening if you look for the good and you look for processes that many people in those processes have found pretty rewarding and worth their time. Uh, last quick comment, a couple of great process, well, a couple of significant Mekong processes, the Strategic Environmental Assessment, uh, which reported in 2010, and then the MRC Council study, uh, pretty decent process whilst preparing the report, but then as soon as the reports were finished, boom, end, end of the deliberative process. There was no then, you know, learning, reflecting, sort of still going on with the time. And I, I thought that that was a shame for the effort that had been put into decent bodies of work, not perfect, um, but the deliberative process stopped when it was probably uh, should have just been kept going for a while. I hope the proactive regional planning, Mr. Soperin, 
that it's not just feed the model, write the scenarios, finish the report, done, but that you get that phase two space to actually test it a bit more. Thanks. Yeah. Quick response to that one, Mr. Shuprin? Yes. Uh, maybe it, it's too, too, how to say, uh, it doesn't really stop there. It, it doesn't really uh, seem like we produce it. And I mean, uh, the, the council study uh, and also the, uh, the the assessment, it doesn't mean that the we, we we try a lot of uh, effort and resource to produce it and stop there. It's still uh, been a review uh, in terms of the study and uh, the product itself, and it will it will still uh, be useful for the ongoing study and assessment uh, that we are still working. And also uh, the, 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 the product that we are, the, the project that we are still working on, the pro regional, uh, proactive regional planning, we, we still use some of the product that we, we, we did early as well. Okay, so a sustained and inclusive action to follow up on all those knowledge products, it seems to be is what's needed at the moment. There is an online question, am I correct? Can we show our online participant and if that person could just jump in and ask the question? Okay, uh, is our online colleague ready to ask the question now, or has the question been written? It's written. Okay, can someone ask the question? Agus, can you ask the question? Okay, the question is from Kevin Lee. I am wondering if we should address the issue of disinformation slash misinformation when we are going to engage with think tanks or build up thought leadership on water, energy, climate nexus of knowledge in the Mekong region. Anyone who from, from the panel who would like to attempt to respond to that question? Pechamon, go ahead. Hello, Kevin. Um, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I feel like it also segues into a lot of what we've been talking about, which is what constitutes credible speculation, what constitutes credible knowledge, um, how do we go about ascertaining that? And it also speaks to, I think, the point about the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement as well. Because one of the values of multi-stakeholder engagement lies in the fact that you can actually verify information that way, right? It's about, I think, John, you made the point about, uh, what was it, the replicability of the information and the um, speculation. Repeatability. Repeatability, thank you. So. I mean, this is basically part of the scientific method, right? And, and I feel like when it comes to handling questions around disinformation, misinformation, it is important that you, of course, verify the information, triangulate it, right? And, and ensure that there is that repeatability process um, involved in knowledge creation. And so I would think that, you know, going to your question, Kevin, about whether people need to be mindful, I, I think, yes, I think we, with engaging with any actor, um, we have to be mindful of misinformation, disinformation risks, and we have to be constantly assessing the knowledge um, that they are putting out and, and trying to be as objective as possible. Thanks, Jan sure Pichuman. I'm not entirely sure if that answered his question 100%. I, th I think it does somehow. But if you have something to add on that one, if you can just keep it for now, because we have a question from the floor. Erin, go ahead. Now maybe yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for this great panel and uh, all the discussion. I, I, a little bit related to the last question. And uh, the first time I say I, I really like the title of this session because you you call it mind the gaps. And I and I thought mind the gaps. You can be two things. It's let's think about where the gaps are, and we've been doing that. But but also don't step into the gap. There's a gap between the land the the station and the train and don't fall into that gap. And I, and I think that uh, researchers in this room and, and also uh, different organizations that are working with knowledge and trying to, to work towards development goals, uh, they have to do both. And I think in my own experience in this region and actually meeting many of the researchers in this room, I know there are a lot of gaps that researchers have to be careful not to fall into. And, and that is, there are certain uh, questions that they avoid asking, and there are certain there are groups of people that are stakeholders that that 
it's not easy to, first of all, get access to. And if one gets access to them, it's difficult to share their, their knowledge and in their research reporting. And I think that we all know this from different experiences. And, uh, and we can, if we want to add one more thing, it's that there's a lot of information out there that the, the researchers in this room can't access. Uh, it might just be because there's a cost tied to it. We, I saw that just a few months ago, visiting a project where, where there was a lot of information, but, but it wasn't accessible and it, it had to be bought and it was going to be costly. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why information is missing and why it can also be difficult to share information. I think this is the way it is. And the kind of change that uh, you've been discussing uh, that you're aiming for with these kinds of alliances is a really kind of a transformational change because we know that the, the progress, as, as you made the point in the morning session, that, that the, the, the trajectory of development in the region is uh, growth, but at the expense of equality and environmental sustainability. And, and this is also well documented. Um, so my question is, I mean, what can a, a regional network or a regional alliance, what, kinds of, what kind of partnership can one put together that can try to expand which gaps it's possible to investigate and which gaps and, and to also narrow those dangerous gaps to make more space for your investigations. And I, I'm kind of curious to hear some reflections on like, what would an alliance or a network need? What kinds of partners does it need in order to just expand that space a little bit? Because I, I think we can't imagine really eliminating it, but uh, you know, yeah, that's a that's thanks. A Very well said, uh, Erin. Before I ask the panel to respond to that one, is there anyone from the floor who would like to respond to the questions or reflect further? What kind of platform should we have to be able to respond to these gaps? Ajanotai? Okay, maybe it's just a private conversation. I think Ajanotai. Uh, let's not force, uh, <laughs> we can share it later, but any, anyone else who would like to take on that point and, and, and share what you were thinking? Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Microphone, please. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, actually, I would like to share some key points. It's really important that we are networking especially uh, when we are working with a project or any certain things that we design because we are the level of the decision maker and this is making and uh, develop a very, in very good initiate, initiative plan of action but my observation i would like to share that if uh, if i may from our experiences uh, first of all we should uh, think about the participatory approach because when we try to throw something to the people and encourage to be uh, encourage them to follow us, we should seek for the uh, participatory approach first. And secondly, we are asking for the accountability because we are networking not only we are receiving or recipient, but or just giving on and that's it. No, uh, accountability is really important right now. And plus the economic uh, nowadays is it, it required for all of us uh, to do a really uh, uh, comprehensive project proposal. And the next one it I think is a uh, collaborations between the in my environmentalists and also decision making. Uh, this morning, the, our friends from Thailand already uh, state some uh, key message that people who are doing the planning, but they don't know how to do a really good technologies or environment, knowledge or what, whatever, and et cetera. And the next point is the uh, management tool. It's supposed to be really clearly. Management tool is not only for the project management, but how to make it a really outstanding and effectiveness for all that easy for us to do the assessment. And I do think is the next point is an indicators and uh, indicate a significant uh, advice impacts on environment. So in the Mekong region, water, energy, climate change, we do have three things together, but three things is similar, but not the same. 
the climate change and disaster, not the same, my dear. Therefore, when we are doing the planning carefully, uh, climate change, disaster, not the same, right? Therefore, and then talking about the water is another things and energy as well. Mm -hmm. So we sometimes, somehow we can connect to each other, but not on subjects. Therefore, this is a really important for us because we are the person who are play a really crucial role in development of the proposal of planning uh, to let other people to follow us. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. So as a way to uh, wrap up um, our, 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 our discussions, how do you reflect on these two points? So maybe I wonder if, if, if each of you could have uh, a minute or two to respond. So Mr. Superin, go ahead first. Okay, thanks a lot, Albert. And also saying uh, for, to, to Aaron as well. I think you, you, uh, we, we are we sitting here, we know that there are a lot of uh, uh, forum, there are a lot of consultation, there are a lot of networks, CSO network and also for the MRC we organize the uh, uh, annually uh, the regional consultation forum where we engage a lot of stakeholders as well. But still, uh, gaps is 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 still they are still discussing. So I think uh, the best point uh, the best is we start we still continue uh, to work uh, in term of team up the the different network the different uh, group. Uh, and then let the researcher uh, be in a one group and also the MOC uh, uh, continue at the regional stakeholder forum, uh, the summonet uh, continue and also MTT continue. But at one point we need to sit together, the big network sit together and then map out together uh, where, how we can make sure that all the study or the research uh, can, can put in one place and share and share it uh, uh, and it make it easy to access by everyone. Okay, so how to enable effective sharing of information that we already have is an important point that you're making, Mr. Sapirin. Ajahn Pichaman, go ahead. I was trying to pass it to you. <laughs> I, I think I'd like to echo what you were saying as well. And this is going to sound ever so slightly self-serving. Um, because I think this session that you have, the people that you have speaking here, and you can remove me from the equation if you like and just replace me with a random academic, but I think this panel represents the polarity of ideas that we want to see in any alliance, in any platform that would allow us to actually critically interrogate those gaps that need to be expanded, as you said, and addressed. Um, and those gaps that we want to kind of not really step into, right? So I think it's the, these types of exchanges that we need and we need to not be afraid of disagreeing with one another because that is how we get progress. Um, and we need to have different stakeholders in the room, again, who don't always see eye to eye. Um, so I feel like, you know, I'm looking at the um, the sign up here that says Macron Regional Water Energy and Climate Alliance meeting. And I think when we think about alliance, we often think like-minded but that's not necessarily the case because ultimately we might be working towards the same goals and we might have very different ideas of how to arrive at that goal. Um, and it's useful to have those discussions to see where convergences might occur, but also to better understand why things aren't happening you know, with the MRC, for instance, not to spotlight you, but, you know, or, or at the local level um, and, and to really have those dialogues. So to me, I think it's the polarity ideas and, and again, not fearing to actually dissent or disagree. Thank you, Ajahn Pichuman. Pirum? Um, I wouldn't have much to say. Uh, I totally agree with what uh, the two speaker has highlighted. Uh, the, the, the things that I still want to say is, uh, technical resources uh, that are important for different stakeholders should be, because we had a lot of research fellow here who are expert in doing research and having all the information, but um, how we place these resources into those institutions and organization that are limited uh, capacity in, in finding information and resources. And secondly, it's about, um, uh, multi-stakeholder multi consultative uh, probably meeting or a platform, a technology platform where you store all the information that are trustworthy uh, and it could actually translate it into the local language so we can use at the local level as well. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, John. Thanks, Albert. So um, just one thing, uh, going back to Kevin, if he's still online, he was asking about 
uh, information, disinformation, and sort of he had that cloudy question mark sort of towards think tanks. I think that think tanks is a little bit of a loaded concept, and uh, a lot of the organizations here wouldn't describe themselves as a think tank. Um, and so, you know, that's just a, a, a descriptive name. But the um, the uh, think tanks, the reason it's loaded is a lot of think tanks have a particular ideology, you know, attached to them. You know, particular, you know, so we look at different political philosophies that sort of influence everything that they do. But so back to the alliance there. So um, yeah, what is the next generation sort of constructive alliance? You know, in in the Mekong region here, um, what are its values? Right. So it's not a matter of yes, we want to be an alliance, but what are the things that are, the members of the alliance might agree to sort of share? We will share respect for different types of knowledge. We will share respect for um, a quality of of voice. You know, you can have a a bit of a, a, a charter and very different people can end up sort of saying, yeah, I'm happy to be part of that alliance. But you do have to agree with those core values a little bit. I'm not sure, can't remember what the Summonet Charter is, values, um, what you're thinking about, whether it's due for an update, whatever, don't know. Um, a few of us were involved in something previously, Empower. It had a very simple charter. It was trying to democratise water governance, full stop. And it was trying to do that by transparency and improving understanding between the countries of the Mekong region, sort of full stop, you know. Um, and if you're if you could say tick tick tick, we're interested in those three, you're in, you know. Um, so I wonder for the alliance. We had a bit of a chat on the phone halfway through last year, I think, Chayanis, and Louis or someone said, you know, what would be the values of such an alliance? And I think that's worth thinking about rather than just saying yes, there's an alliance. Yes, it's a next generation funding opportunity. You know, what is it? Would we all like to be part of it? And if so, what would be the the values that we would um, happily sort of uh, share? Thanks. Thank you very much, John. So what you're saying is that we need to have a common vision, but not only common, but also shared across everyone in, 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 in the region. Yeah, but the common vision might not be the common vision of what the region should be, mm. more the common, more the, the set of values that, okay. you know, yes, if I join this uh, guiding principles, thank you very much, Pichuan, <laughs> you know, um, what are the guiding principles that, you know, would be acceptable to this, right. this floor of people? Thanks. Okay. Let's take note of that guiding principles. With that, um, I'd like to thank our panels for very insightful contribution, for agreeing to contribute to our, our discussions, maybe no matter how limiting the quadrants would be, but I hope the quadrants is useful. So uh, by no means, it's not a celebration of Donald Rumsfeld, but he was just an, uh, he gave me an idea that this could be useful to, to, to frame our conversation. So with that, a big round of applause to our panel.